Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I am your host, Harry Simeu. And on this week's edition, we will be looking back at that incredible victory over Aston Villa. What a roller coaster of emotions that was. Arsenal having gone behind twice, managed to take all three points. Um, some uh, individual brilliance. Some poor defending as usual uh, and of course lots and lots to get into uh, following on from that game. I'll be joined a little bit later on in the show by former Gunners midfielder David Hillier to get his take on the game uh, and all things Arsenal. So looking forward to catching up with David too who of course has been on the show a couple of times now. Uh, so big thanks to David for returning and I'm sure you guys will enjoy what David has to say. Uh, let's start with a game uh, in chronological order. Let's start with Aston Villa's goal. Um, I think when I picked the team uh, on the preview show, I went with everything that Unai Emery went with. Again, it was one player out and that player was uh, Bukayo Saka. I didn't expect Bukayo Saka to be given the nod um, in the Premier League, partly because of the fact that he's not played a great deal of football. And secondly, because I didn't think Unai Emery would necessarily pick somebody who played uh, the game on Thursday. I thought that it was the, the opportunity to bring some fresh legs in and I thought given what had happened with Mesut Ozil that maybe he would have got the nod unfortunately well not unfortunately because Bukayo Saka done pretty well but Mesut Ozil again was left on the bench and I was even wondering if he was on the bench at one point because when I got to the ground admittedly I hadn't seen the team prior to walking into the stadium I got in there quite early and the players were warming up but Mesut Ozil wasn't warming up initially um don't know where he was probably in the dressing room um God knows what, but he came out and joined the warm-up eventually and then it was evident that Mesut Ozil, of course, was included on Arsenal's subs bench. Now, did Unai Emery make the right decision, in my opinion, by starting Bukayo Saka? Absolutely, yeah. I can't knock it because I thought that in the first half, a first half in which Arsenal were really, really poor, Bukayo Saka was probably the one shining light and dare I say Bukayo Saka had a bigger impact than the £72 million Nicola Pepe. So, I don't think that was a wrong decision. I don't think that was a bad decision. And I was pleased uh, to see Saka get the minutes because as a fan uh, and as somebody who wants Arsenal to do well, you want to see good performances rewarded. And his performance out in Germany was certainly uh, positive and he certainly deserved uh, the opportunity in the Premier League game. And, and you know, he didn't look out of his depth. And I think that's the, that's the important point here. Uh, a young kid who's not played um, any Premier League football in the past, if I'm not mistaken, he's made a few Europa League appearances, but this was the opportunity for him to show that he can mix it amongst the big boys. And I thought he did. And I'll come on to the sending off in a little bit uh, later, but I felt that he was probably unlucky to be hooked as a result of the tactical changes. But let's go back to Villa's goal, uh, where I said I was going to start and I drifted there. Apologies. Um, it, it's just typical Arsenal defending, isn't it? And, and it's Arsenal's non-existent midfield that constantly bites us in the arse and people will talk about Socrates and talk about David Lewis and we'll come on to those two uh, in a little bit but it it all stems from our midfield and I know Matteo Genduzzi in the second half turned into this absolute juggernaut of a player and in my opinion was the catalyst for getting Arsenal over the line but you've got to look at what he's done in the first half and you've got to look at his performance and his performance was as bad as anybody else's in that first period. Now, if you watch the first goal again, the ball comes in from a wide area and, and bearing in mind Villa had created some chances up until this point. Um, Trezeguet on the right hand side was giving Kolasinac a torrid time, a torrid time. Uh, Danny Ceballos went out there to help him a few times and he couldn't handle the, the Egyptian either. And it was a constant problem. Those wide areas where Villa felt that they could get in on us. Uh, and rightly so. You know, Ainsley Maitland-Niles uh, got caught the wrong side of his man and picked up his first yellow card as well. So the, the flanks was obviously something that Aston Villa looked at, something that Aston Villa targeted. And, you know, when you're defending, you want to see your team remain compact. You want to see your team, um, if they need to, get a little bit narrow in the defence and, and I've got no issue with that some of the best defensive units in the world do that but when those crosses come in you have to deal with them you have to pick up your men you have to track your men and Matteo Ginduzi just lets John McGinn 
drift completely past him. He doesn't even know he's there. Um, the ball comes in around the top and John McGinn finds himself uh, a few yards out and manages to steer the cross into the back of the net and give Aston Villa the lead. Now, that is unforgivable from Matteo Guendouzi. That's terrible, shocking defending. And the way he turns around after to look around as if to say to his teammates, well, who's picking him up? You should be picking him up, mate. You need to be picking up John McGinn's run there. That's poor, poor, poor defending. And can you just imagine that that was Granit Xhaka, what the reaction would have been? The knives would have been well and truly out. That is shocking defending from Matteo Guendouzi. And whilst he was immense in the second half, and I'm going to come on to that and I'm going to praise him, we shouldn't forget these things. And this is a steep learning curve for a player who at times is brilliant, but still isn't able to deliver that top, top level of performance on a consistent basis, even within one game, let alone over the course of a season. You know, there's one great half from Genduzi, one poor half. And, and that's not good enough. You need to be better than that, in my opinion. Um, so, of course, Aston Villa take the lead. Uh, John McGinn opens up the scoring. Uh, and then shortly after that, Ainsley Maitland-Niles receives a second yellow card and is sent off. Now, my first reaction to that when I was in the stadium and I was in the North Bank in the corner, block six, where I normally am, I was sort of right behind the challenge and it looked to me like Ainsley Maitland-Niles had lunged in. His foot was a little bit high. It looked like he'd gone slightly over the top of the ball. And whilst it looked like he made contact because of the direction of the ball, it looked like he caught the man as well. And it looked like a reckless challenge. And when John Moss came over with the yellow card, I didn't have too many complaints, if I'm being totally honest, at the time. But of course, I've since seen it back. I've since watched the match of the day. I've since watched the highlights. And I thought it was extremely harsh that Ainsley Maitland-Niles was shown a second yellow. There clearly gets the ball. And there's a class of sh clash sorry, of shins between the two players. And, you know, both of them come off injured. And I just think that, you know, I, you know, I, I'm a VAR fan. But if VAR can't fix things like that, then, you know, it, it makes me question sort of why we're using it. Now, people are going to say, oh, you know, it can't overturn second yellow cards. Well, that's stupid because ultimately that second yellow card results in a red. So what's the difference between checking it for a second yellow card and checking it for a red? The rule makes absolutely no sense to me, as the lots of the new rules, lots of the new directives. Um, Unai Emery took a lot of stick yesterday um, in the first half, and, and rightly so, in my opinion. I've been somebody who's been critical of Unai Emery. It looks as though his team lacks direction at times, lacks ideas, lacks philosophy. And um, one thing that he'd done in the first half that particularly annoyed me was when Ainsley Maitland-Niles went off, you know, the minute Ainsley Maitland-Niles went down, Callum Chambers has to be warming up. He has to be warming up, and he wasn't. It took ages for Callum Chambers to get up and go and start warming up. If I'm the manager, that's my first thought. You know, you should be turning around, or the coach, and being straight down Callum Chambers' throat. Mate, get on with it. Get on your bike. Get jogging. And that didn't happen. It took far too long for me. Um, Freddie Lundberg was noticeably incensed by the sending off of Ainsley Maitland-Niles. He went absolutely nuts on the touchline. A bit of passion there, a bit of fire. It's what we like to see. Um, but again, I'd question why none of them asked Callum Chambers to start warming up straight away. Now, I get that maybe Unai Emery wanted to hold on till half time before making the change. I think it was only five or six minutes or so before the break. But I thought moving Granite Xhaka into that right back position was absolute suicide. Absolute suicide. And it's a dodgy decision that fortunately for us, we managed to get away with because Granite Xhaka was already on a yellow card. Um, Granite Xhaka's left footed, so left footed it's unreal. And you just felt that if Aston Villa's winger managed to isolate Granit Xhaka once in the last five minutes of that second half, you could have had a situation where Granit Xhaka was drawn into a foul and we could have ended up going into that second period with nine men. And I just think that's poor, poor management. And I know we got away with it, but, you know, I think these things, they should be picked up on. And I think these are schoolboy errors and I don't like to see this sort of thing happen. I don't agree with it. Um, let me know what you guys think. I think, like I said, we got away with it. But for me, Granit Xhaka is not the solution in that position. And then, you know, there's all sorts of incidents going on. After we've gone down to, to 10, Socrates gets involved in a, a little confrontation with Wesley. 
sort of goes down on the floor holding his face as if he's been um, sort of hit in the face. And the shithousery of Socrates comes to the forefront, doesn't it? But the whole half just ended up being so chaotic and so messy. And it's not what you want to see. You know, you want to see Arsenal in control, particularly in this type of fixture at home to Aston Villa. It's a game the Arsenal should be winning. And, and there was a guy behind me in the stadium who was going, I don't know what it is with Arsenal fans. They turn up to the game. They expect to win. Yeah, too right we expect to win against a newly promoted side at home because we have aspirations of qualifying for the Champions League. And if you want to do that, these are the type of games you need to be winning. Of course we expect to win. Um, but yeah, the, the, the halftime whistle went shortly afterwards and boos rang around the Emirates Stadium. And I don't agree with booing the team off at halftime. But I understand why people were frustrated. I get it. You know, we see the same problems over and over again. Uh, and, you know, if you do the same thing over and over again and you get the same results, that's insanity, isn't it? Uh, and it feels like with Arsenal, we just see those same problems, that the lack of midfield balance, the, the lack of tracking runs, the fullbacks being caught out of position, the centre-backs being... Uh, so error prone it's just the same problems over and over again and I could understand people's frustration at the break and then the teams uh, come out for the second half uh, Bukayo Saka was sacrificed as, as I've already said and Callum Chambers were brought on at right back and Arsenal went to a sort of a flat three in midfield Pepe and Aubameyang looked as though they were playing like a front two um, and that flat midfield is something that you know we've had problems with I don't think it necessarily works um, with that personnel uh, in particular Granite Xhaka Ceballos and Ginduzi uh, and you know uh, like I said I thought Saka was really really unlucky to be the man sacrificed because I thought he was more effective than Pepe but you know when you spend 72 million pounds uh, on a winger uh, on a forward you're probably a bit reluctant to take him off and I think that played a part there because his performance certainly didn't warrant him staying on the pitch um Pepe eventually scored. Arsenal got the penalty, which we'll come on to in a minute. But whilst we're on the subject of Pepe, I want to just touch on that. Um, I thought he was poor. I, I don't see what he offers to this team. And it's early days. And people keep you know, referring back to that point of, you know, Burkamp took a while to settle. Thierry Henry took a while to settle. And I'm willing to give Nicola Pepe some more time before I sit here going, oh, you know, what a waste of money. But I'm not quite seeing what it is that he offers to the team. You know, we saw at Anfield that his pace can be of great use, that his trickery at times can be of great use. But we saw a lack of end product. I thought there were a couple of occasions yesterday in the first half where he was attacking the fullback. And again, we saw that lack of end product. And I think, you know, getting the goal that he did, you'd hope would allow him to kick on, will give him that boost, uh, fingers crossed. But for me, the jury's still out on Nicola Pepe. Um, and that's not to say I'm writing him off. That's not to say I don't want him to succeed. It's not to say I'm going to sit here calling him a waste of money. But for me, he's got to show more. And at the moment, it's not quite happening. Um, and that's a little bit disappointing. Um, Arsenal, of course, went on to get the penalty and level things. And it was a brilliant piece of play from Matteo Genduzzi, who picked the ball up um, sort of in a wide left area and literally just grabbed the game by the scruff of the neck. He literally picked up the ball and thought, you know what, fuck this, I'm going alone. And he driv he's sorry, he's driven into the box, um, driving forward with power, going past players and eventually gets brought down just inside the penalty area. No question about the fact that it was a penalty. Um, and, and like I said, Matteo Genduzzi was the catalyst for Arsenal getting back into this game. His energy, his passion, his desire... All things that can't be questioned. You can question his technical ability at times. You can question the fact that he's a little bit rash. You can sometimes question his positional sense. But in terms of heart, passion, desire to win, you cannot question that about Matteo Genduzzi. You've got to say. Um, wins the penalty. And I'm standing there thinking, Jesus Christ, why is Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who's in such a rich vein of form in front of goal, not taking this penalty and it, it, it came out in the aftermath that Aubameyang's given the penalty to Pepe um, to give him that that first Arsenal goal to give him that lift to give him that confidence boost and that's something we've seen from Aubameyang before 
gave a penalty to Lacazette when he was having a hard time, if you remember. And, you know, that's really rare to see in a striker because strikers are usually selfish and rightly so. You know, he, he was in the running for the Golden Boot last year. He finished joint top. Uh, and you'd imagine that he'll be up there again this season and he wants to win that. So to give up a penalty, which is almost uh, your bread and butter for a striker, is is really unselfish. And I think, you know, let's hope now that Pepe uh, takes that on and, and builds on that because Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang there has done a, a great thing. Um, but just moments later, Aston Villa go and go back in front. And I cannot express to you how pissed off and angry I was when that goal went in. And that goal is just a, a, a catalogue of errors. You know, there's a pass from David Lewis out to Callum Chambers, which, you know, you you could say it's not a bad pass, but it's a difficult pass to control. Doesn't excuse Callum Chambers there. He should control that. It's poor. Um, whether that pass was the right pass to make it is another matter. Callum Chambers fails to control it. Villa pick up the ball and they break on us. And Jack Grealish gets to the sort of left-hand side of the penalty area. He's dribbling. The right back is caught out of position. You see Socrates go over, having to go over, which clears some space in the middle. Grealish cuts the ball back brilliantly. Grealish, who I thought was really, really good, by the way. I think he's a fantastic player. Uh, really stylish, really silky. And I think in a better team, you'd see the best of Jack Grealish. But anyway... He pulls the ball back across the goal. And then I'm looking for David Lewis to be aware of his surroundings. He's got to be side on. He's got to be aware of players making runs into the box. And it feels to me like he's just completely unaware of Wesley's run. And he just takes too long to adjust himself. And before you know it, Wesley's nipped in front of him and, and got a foot to it. And Villa are back in front. And I was really, really pissed off, really disappointed, as I'm sure most of the stadium were. You know, Arsenal had been given a lifeline a, a way back into this game and then to throw that that away just moments after was just so typical of this Arsenal side and, and typical of the way we defend and it was really really disappointing and you know some people will say that it was Callum Chambers's fault I think that when you lose the ball there you still got to be able to defend that scenario and I don't think David Lewis has defended that anywhere near well enough and it feels like David Lewis is giving a goal away every week. And I doubt there's a striker in the league that contributes to that many 